All right, so I'm going to go over uh, Hebrews chapter 9, and let's just get into it. Then verily the first covenant had also ordinances of divine service in a worldly sanctuary. And um, so basically, we're going to see how over here it's talking about how, you know, the old covenant, the first covenant had, um, you know, outward... Um, Outward observances and stuff like that. Um, the physical sanctuary, worldly sanctuary. And um, he's comparing the old to the new, which is the spiritual. And for there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shewbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark and the covenant overlaid round about it with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant. Okay. It's the stone tablets and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Um, hmm, so I wonder what that means. Can't say in detail. Uh, now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the highest the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while well, as the first tabernacle was yet standing. So he's speaking of the old... Um, sanctuary and talking about the high priest now which he's comparing Jesus Christ to and it says the Holy Ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing um, so that's very interesting I don't know. <laughs> kind of hard to understand for me, but the Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. Um, which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. And so, I'm wondering, like, in what way is the Holy Ghost signifying this? Is he talking as, like, a lot of times the Holy Ghost is uh, used with the scriptures as in, like, um, you know, the the word is God breathed, and um, you know, men were moved by the Holy Ghost to write the scriptures, basically. Um, or he's just saying that these things that were made, you know, in the name of God, were used in this way as a figure. It was used as a figure for the time then present. And I think that I mentioned earlier how he talks about, yeah, just over here in verse, in chapter 8, he talks about, you know, he uses example and shadow, and these are all words that have to do with, you know, um, typology, basically the study of figures. When, like, in the new Bible versions, they'll use the word types and stuff instead of figure uh, in some places, but... Yeah, this is what we see in the King James Bible's figure. And it's the same idea, though. 
that they were kind of uh, they were used for a purpose, but they were also um, symbolic of something greater uh, that was that was yet to be revealed. Um, and so. Even the uh, the gifts and the sacrifices that the high priest, you know, offered, could not make him perfect. As pertaining to the conscience, that's interesting too. What does that mean? Obviously, we know that you know no human is sinless. If we're going to go with that route, except for you know Jesus Christ is sinless. He's fully God, fully man, and so. Even though, um, like, <clears throat> the sacrifices and stuff were used to cover uh, the sins of the Hebrews to give to offer them forgiveness, it did not, um, you know, it didn't wash away their, you know, original, original sin or anything uh, like that. So, um, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. But Christ being come to an high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building. So I've got an arrow for the time of reformation down to the next verse. So it's like I was trying to hint myself that it goes on to explain the time of reformation and I'm sure that there's some dispens dispensational teachings that uh, use <clears throat> have different ideas of that time of reformation um, Christ being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say of this building Basically, you know, when Christ's ministry came, uh, when and when he ascended into the heavens, or when he initiated the new covenant, I guess, also just, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal, eternal redemption for us. And this is another thing where people try to take this literally, and I don't think this is to be said literal, where they get this image that in heaven there's a tabernacle and a mercy seat and everything uh, like there was in the Old Testament, because they're kind of stuck on this physical, literal thing, and they think that there's a uh, literal, you know, spiritual or whatever tabernacle in heaven and stuff with the mercy seat and all this. I think this is just uh, language just used, it's just symbolic. Um, you know, Christ didn't do exactly what the high priest did in the Old Testament. Um, you know, by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And, I mean, basically, you know, Christ died on the cross. And, um, and it's in that sense that his blood... Uh, cleanses us and you know that's where you know redemption happened at the cross and so because there are people that teach like I said uh, in heaven there's an actual mercy seat and stuff and they'll say well it wasn't accomplished at the cross it was accomplished after after the cross and then he ascended into heaven and then he went to the mercy seat no it was accomplished at the cross and um, you know that pretty much takes away the importance of the cross <laughs> trying to do that uh um, so a lot of people might even teach that or believe that, that there's a mercy seat in heaven, but then like they don't even, but then, you know, they're going to acknowledge that like the cross is what it's all about. And so I don't even know if they even follow their own beliefs on that. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. Of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? <coughs> and so, um, 
you know, basically he's, 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 he's said this before in previous chapters and stuff too, about how much greater Christ is because Christ is eternal. He is God, you know, his blood is pure. It's nothing like any of the temporary sacrifices and stuff. Um, it's far beyond that. So he says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through eternal, the eternal spirit, offered himself without spot to God? He mentions how he's eternal, again. And um, so that's contrasted with temporary, you know. Um, so uh, his uh, redeeming power is eternal, you know, redeeming power. And it's also interesting, I think, that he says, that, you know, he offered himself without spot also. It speaks of his sinlessness, but he says uh, he offered himself to God. And another interesting thing there is that when it says he offered him to God, they're going to say, well, see, that means that Jesus isn't God. But no, that's not what it means. It's speaking of God the Father. Jesus Christ offered, uh, you know, in his humanity, he offered him, himself uh, to the Father. Okay. And purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And it's interesting how basically it talks about serving God. Basically from being lost to being saved and it's equating being saved with serving God. And then so that's where I would come in with the uh, lordship salvation doctrine because there's people who say that well, you know, Christians uh basically you can be saved, you can be born again and not be a servant of Christ. That doesn't make any sense at all. That's not what the Bible teaches. It talks about serving God. And, of course, no Christian, you know, serves God perfectly. We're not sinless. But there's the change where, you know, you do become a servant of God. And it's not just by name. It's a change of heart. And uh, so that's something that, you know, a person has to knowingly, willingly submit to, to come to Christ. So, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Talks about Christ as mediator between God and man. He uh, brought on the New Testament. And um, that's basically what I think I always I keep saying in Daniel 9.27. Whatever that verse is, it talks about uh, he shall confirm the covenant with many. He is the mediator of the New Testament. And so Jesus confirmed the covenant, or the testament. Those are interchangeable terms there. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, uh, redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Okay, and... So, <clears throat> some interesting stuff here too, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, um, and then for here in my Bible it says, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal Hmm, the first, the transgressions, the sins of the first agreement, first testament. So, it kind of makes me wonder exactly what it means when it says redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. Is this talking about people who, uh... <clears throat> I don't know. Is it talking about like the Hebrews in general, how, you know, they were so, uh, you know, they were backsliders and everything, um, in the Old Testament, and that he's kind of. bringing them back. I'm probably getting off track here. I don't know. Uh, 
I don't know. I'm just kind of curious exactly what this means. Basically, we know that this means that, you know, Christ is the Redeemer, though, and basically uh, that um, redemption is in Christ, and that's how people receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Um, I'm just, I'm probably getting too confused about that, but that's something I kind of want to understand a little more. Um, and plus, you know, this makes me think of how people, I talk about the same things over and over again, but people think that, um, people didn't receive the promise of eternal inheritance before Jesus died, and, uh, that they went to some kind of a purgatory or something, but this doesn't mean that, that, um, people in the Old Testament, you know, Abraham and obviously the patriarchs, any believers, uh, before Christ came, they did receive, uh, they already received the promise, um, you know, through through their faith. Um, but Jesus still had to come and, and accomplish what was already going to be accomplished. For there were a testament, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death, death of a testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at while, at all while the testator liveth. And I've heard Brian Denlinger and so many others just repeat this over and over again. Uh, they're dispensationalists and they uh, think that, you know, they learn this from Ruckman or whatever and they think that they're so smart to say that, you know, well the New Testament didn't actually start, you know, like when's the New Testament start in the Gospels and... Well, it didn't actually start until Jesus died. And, um, <laughs> it's just funny how they just, they just say this over and over again. And anyway, for the test, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. And, uh, Besides me hearing this used over and over again, I really don't uh, want to comment too much on that, but uh, that's something I want to look into more too. Whereupon neither the first testament uh, was dedicated without blood. Uh, for when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things, and here we have another word that's like in samples, examples, figures, shadows, patterns of things, and the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. It was necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices. That's another verse that I would like to look at in the commentaries. It's just a bit of a brain twister. Um... Hmm. Should be purified with these. So, I mean, I guess basically again what I'm getting here is that he's kind of saying again that the blood of these bulls and goats and lambs and everything are, um, they're a, they're a figure of the true redeeming blood of Christ um, so they're an example of that, they're like a pattern of that, but they're not the full effect, you know, anywhere near that, and the greater thing is the spiritual, so, you know, comparing the physical to the spiritual, the spiritual is greater, Christ's blood, you know, is eternal, um, you know, Christ was completely without spot, for Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true. 
but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Okay, and I do believe that, you know, heaven is some kind of spiritual realm, which is beyond our knowledge, but, uh, you know, from what the Bible says, yeah, that's, you know, um, to appear in the presence of God for us. And then again, that's kind of interesting too, appearing in, in the presence of God. So we think of, you know, we think of like Jesus and the Father as having like two different bodies in heaven or something. That's our our image in our head. But we have to remember that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one in a divine essence. And so we really can't, you know, um, this language of him being in the presence of God is basically that... You know, Christ is in heaven, in the spiritual realm, and um, which is where God is, and obviously Christ is God also. He's the Son of God, and it's, you know, we don't have to get too literal with this. You know, we have ideas in our imagination, um, but again, maybe I'm getting too off track. But, uh, yeah. So, it's like Christ didn't, you know, cease to exist or anything. Christ still is very much alive. He very much exists, but it's in the spiritual realm. And, um, he's comparing this to, like, the tabernacle and stuff, so. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, but as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others nor yet that he should offer himself often. Okay, he, um, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now since in the end of the world hath he appeared and put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. That's interesting that it says the end of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. His offering was made once, and as an appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. And I use that verse a lot. That's a great verse for a lot of reasons, but um, For, you know, people talking about multiple judgments and stuff, too, that's why I've used that. You know, there's one judgment, one death. Um, so Christ was offered... Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. And um, this used to be because, you know, I was a dispensationalist and I thought this was like a rapture passage. That's why I did that because I thought the look unto him when he shall appear was like the, uh, the, um, <clears throat> rapture. But I would say this is when a person dies. We look forward to being with Christ. And that's why he's going to appear, you know, uh, that's interesting too. I should go over that more, but. This also makes me think of Calvinism when I read this, how Christ offered to bear the sins of many. And it's like Calvinism believes that Christ died for the few because the many are the ones who are lost. And uh, I'm sure there's some interesting... I've said that way, word way too many times, but there's some implications with Calvinism here um, about the limited atonement of Christ, you know, how he only died for the elect. Um, and they could probably use this and say, well, see, it says many. It doesn't say that, you know, he died for all men, but, you know, just some. But that's obviously a misinterpretation misinter of that. But um, Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. And so the whole point of that is to that him previously speaking about how the other priests had to do this, you know, annually, continually, and, and Christ did the sacrifice once, you know, for everyone, basically. So, um, many, um, everyone is many, 
and so many doesn't mean you know like a selection from everyone and so uh but obviously only the ones who put their faith in Christ are the ones who receive the gift so um but it's for everyone it's for anyone who is willing and so um i think that's a good point that i just made that i just came up with but uh you know um that's the way i see it that that um many doesn't have to be um in contradiction with everyone you know it doesn't have to you know um everyone is many okay so that's uh chapter 9 we'll go into chapter 10 thanks I'd like to hear what you think god bless